sitting having lunch with uh, Professor Gombo here, and he tells me that Nuno's book will be launched tomorrow. So just a little bit of intro on this book because it ties in nicely to what I'm about to, to present. So DII last year, there was a workshop going on here in this room where Professor Nuno Gill was presenting an idea of a text uh, of a book, and he was seeking contributions from the audience here at the DII to contribute a chapter. And between last year's meeting and this year's meeting, the book is now a reality, and it will be launched tomorrow, I am told, with authorship by everybody here. Yes. How this ties into what I would like to present is, um, with, for ESCA, we've been publishing papers and conference uh, presentations and proceedings, and we are all in the business of publishing papers, so we thought all these great ideas that have been coming, we've started a paper, what does sustainability look like in the different cities? And then take it a step further, what needs to happen in engineering education? What changes need to happen at the different levels? At the classroom level, at the department level, at the university level, and as a profession? What needs to happen? What changes need to take place? And that's what we hope to bring together in that paper. Um, so, just as a starting point, this is what I have to give. It's not on sustainability of education itself, right? It's not part of it. Because like, uh, there's also an ongoing debate on how to use different methods to make education more sustainable. So given, thank you, given our mandate on this project, it is urban sustainability. So not buildings, but green buildings, not transportation, but sustainable transportation, not energy, but sustainable energy. So generally speaking, as it relates to sustainable cities. And then engineering education is the way we know it, but linking the two together. So that's sort of the perspective. Is that, yeah, answer? Okay. So uh, let me move into the activity. Again, thinking along the sub-disciplines of civil engineering, the cards I have here are the sectors of civil engineering, so buildings, transportation, etc. I'm holding too many things. <laughs> Okay, so Raheem will help distribute. Um, one, each one, one for each person. So this is sort of an individual activity. The reality is, maybe I didn't need cards, but just to make things a little bit exciting, we start with the end point. What does sustainability in 2050 look like? And then backtrack today. What changes would be like to in, in, include in our classrooms? and in your universities and regulatory bodies, etc., to make that happen. So, we have buildings, transportation, energy, water, urban green, waste, and land use. Okay? So everybody hopefully has a card. Feel free to ask for a different one if this is not the sector you want to focus on. And uh, just share your thoughts as we go, and we'll note take as we go. And I'm going to have prompting questions to, to walk us through. Okay, so generally, this is sort of the thought process. Your vision for sustainable cities. What is the future of that sector? So for example, someone who's got waste can say, I imagine the future of waste by 2050 in a particular city to be energy from waste. If that's your vision, okay? What changes need to happen in engineering education? That's sort of the next step. And then, what skills do our engineers need to have? Skills being technical skills, soft skills, tools and software, methodologies, whatever you can think of. Sort of, your input is valuable because you are the ones in direct contact with your students, so you would know best. All right. Is everybody sort of clear on the, on the sort of the process? Okay, so we're only going to spend about 20 minutes on this activity, okay? Every, every question we have, we'll sort of take a couple of uh, responses around the room and we'll move on to the next, and that wraps up. And that will be sort of the starting point of populating that paper. And uh, I ask you to perhaps write your name on that card so that we can add you 
uh, as contributors to that journal paper. We haven't decided where exactly we would send it for publication, but we can discuss this together. All right, so the first question. What is your vision for sustainable cities from the perspective of the urban sector on your part? So maybe give you a few minutes to think about it, and then um, we'll just go around the room, maybe take three responses, and then move on to
and then you can leave the bulk materials on it. That's the future. Yeah. Uh, the future I envision is uh, an expanded mass transit system because the challenge is motorized or the where somebody gets on the machine, whatever form of machine, is going to crowd, whatever, you know, whatever, whether it's a road, whatever. So the direction of uh, Trans, and the uh, underground train system and all this, I think, you know, I think it was people need to get out of their way with the, you know, the public transport system. And you certainly have weather that is conducive to something like that that may not be the case in other countries and other cities. Very mild weather throughout, which enables mass transit. I think it was multimodal. 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 One can walk, they can cycle. Yes, I, I think that's a great opportunity. Yeah. Yes, I'm looking at the future with serious problems. We don't mind level, so we're looking at efficient use of water in these industries, and most of that water will be recycled. Yes. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sure you're all aware about kids working in silos. You know, the the engineers, civil engineers, they, they want to work as civil engineers. They want to be trained as civil engineers away from the planners. And they want to be trained away from the mechanical engineers, away from the electrical engineers. And yet the industry, when they get there, they find themselves in the same office with everyone else. So we need to start thinking engineering or a simply education system that is multi sectoral. So what would you suggest? What is the change That's that you would suggest? The change that I'm suggesting is um, thinking of these mechatronics people. It's one of the way that uh, they moved, they combined mechanical and electronics and, they, and, and they, it's, it's working. So if we start attaching other programs to it, yeah, then they, we begin to realize that uh, uh, the education system of engineering should be integrated away from the traditional way of you know, side operation. We're used to teaching economies of scale. And this has been sort of, we've inherited this from economics. Uh, by and large, people believe that a water system should be a uniform one system in the middle of the city. Uh, the waste management system should be the same. That the more you centralize in an urban context, the better economics you get. The more efficiency you, the efficiencies you get out of the system. I'm not sure that that is still the case in many sectors. I think the new technologies allow us to decentralize many, many more of those those services than we were used to before. And I think the challenge is to ensure that we equip the students to also think about to, to think about also these decentralized service delivery mechanisms. So, well, one thing that I often think about in Toronto, for example, where I live, the water that we use, the water that we use to drink, the water that we use to take a bath, the water that we use to, to water our grass, is all drinkable water, right? So it is extremely pure, it is, there is, and imagine the costs that go into that, and it's centralized. So I wonder why that should be the case. Why can't I not have a purifier just for drinking water, right? And the other ones, okay, you clean it up to some extent, it certainly doesn't need to be that, right? So maybe something to that effect, and to the extent that the engineers and engineering students are involved in the design of it, to not just think always as economies of scale, I got to create a big monster system, and to think more decentralized. And to uh, emphasize uh, the teaching that is based on real life uh, situations, and produce graduates who are able to engage with the complexity of the challenge. They will be employed, they will have, I think, they will develop better values and, and, and competence and competent skills to do with the future challenges that we have. And like what is happening in most universities, that is that are teaching really based on theoretical stuff, entirely theory, when they graduate, they face real challenges of being useful and sensible uh, to the context that they face. Thanks. Thank you. So, can I clap for you uh, to try and make sure that we have education that inspires all stakeholders, like even international level. But in the classroom, maybe to have um, 
also case-based teaching where they can visit like excursions. I'm introducing that in my department because we no longer have will. So if they go and see and learn, they come back and in a way uh, like with what we call outbound, students can go to Vienna to see the best passport shared systems. They come back and be inspired and also offer the same solutions to our African problems. Okay. Also, I would think of the curriculum which will be very flexible, whereby also the students will have uh, the input, whereby we allow the innovation from the student, not from, from the lecturer, but the student being given a certain topic and then drive it the way he wants, and then you should, that should be developed from the air level, not at the higher level, but probably from the uh, the beginning or the curriculum from even the primary school going, going uh, upwards. So avoiding spoon feeding the student, but let the also the be the input from the student. Uh, for the next century is so big, so I think there must be much more uh, work together across boundaries on utopic visions, right? Which seem to be maybe unachievable today, but maybe in 2050 a very feasible project. And this, maybe this project across boundaries of countries in Southern Africa, they, this could start today. I want to give an example. Uh, it's like solar desalination, right? Because uh, today, maybe costs of water is uh, too low to make solar desalination feasible, but uh, materials change and the technologies. So maybe already in a few years, this can be feasible. But then uh, there would be no plans because uh, governments or people would say it's utopic, right? Uh, in Cape Town, they they are building, I guess, a desalination plant currently, which is like not renewable driven, right? And uh, the, the solar is there, and we need to make our the experiences now in order to get ready for the challenges coming. So, uh, and this I think can be only on a cross-border approach. Uh, uh, education for the future. I'm thinking of. Uh situation where whatever engineering we do is uh, we try to provide a sales and complaints uh, system and barriers. Sometimes we don't even consider some of the factors like uh, so we need to look at the uh, education for the future, uh, look at the issue of system of systems where the consideration should be very complex. Like if you are going to do a road for example, is it an area I mean, there are a lot of other sales that can go Rotter are now going into renewables. I uh, can do renewables. I mean, Rotter can generate energy. And uh, so, most of the engineering, I think, a lot of them, uh, we just look at one thing. We don't consider other things that can go along with that. Uh, so that we can maximize contribution to social economic well being of, uh, of the society. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, I would like to go with uh, Rahim and you should start with thinking of distributed, everything distributed. In the days of economics, of economics of scale, is gone. We can see from the phone, before we have a computer center where everybody goes up. Today, this is very efficient. I don't have to, you know. So, uh, if we have to do that, it will be good to introduce electronics. Everything is becoming ICT. Not just knowing the ICT, but why does it where we need to incorporate electronics in all our engineering systems. So, uh, and the Internet of Things, every Internet of Everything. Anything we design now, we should think about exposing it to other people in the world. And that should be Thank you. And of course, with the challenges of resilience, people are now thinking decentralized to address resilience, artificial intelligence. part and parcel of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't have to think about it as sustainability, but that's actually what we do. You know, my daughter was taught about um, you know, uh, plastics, they have fish. So if you want to, to, to throw the plastic into you know, a non-recycled bin, they are small, that's going to have fish. To her, she doesn't think about sustainability. You know, it becomes part and parcel of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm looking to the point where curriculum design really embeds that as you know that's how the students will be 
uh, uh, decision makers of, of, of the future for the students that we take. Really should be taken from. And we are referring to sustainability. I think it's also important to understand that there are global problems and to think of local solutions by engaging things within our reach. It's good for all our young people in the academia to understand that these problems are real and there. But within their reach, what is it that they can make use of to solve the problem that is here while they still look forward to the new technology? Because most of the developing nations, you know, they do not have access to some of this. And some of them need a technical know-how, which they are still not, you know. But there are some things that are within us that we can make use of and gradually, you know, people begin to grow from there. Thank you, David. Yeah. So let's just go around the room. One skill. And we'll, we'll, we'll use that as a wrap. So, uh, uh, I think that um, engineers would, uh, should word. have okay. soft word. skills. One, one word. Soft skills like engaging. They should be very engaging. Soft skills uh, such as engaging. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Programming. Like computer programming, coding? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, to meet the requirement for industrial yeah. revolution. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll, we'll allow that. Okay, thank you. This is such a general uh, word, but I hope you get the, the gist of it. One word. One word. <laughs> you already used up all your words. <laughs> One word. Yeah, a sensitivity. To? The environment. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't get it from the word sensitivity. Exactly, the, exactly my point. That is such a general, but you need to be sensitive. Become aware. Uh, you know, like Prof. Muya said, we generally just consider one thing or a set of conditions that we are taught from engineering uh, and not think about other. Thank you. You are sensitive. Thank you. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. Teamwork. Teamwork. Yes. Social engagement. Social engagement. Christopher, are we too fast for you? <laughs> okay. I was expecting all these um, hardcore technical skills, so I don't have now. I'm I feel like I need to say some hardcore technical skills. But what I've got is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. I had to wait. No, but well, we can give you some time to come back to you to come up with a new one. Synthesize the words. Well, I think maybe the only thing I can do is just explain it. I mean, why it's working because it can't know everything. It's not feasible for an individual to be an expert in everything. So the skill that one needs to be able to work with them, you need to listen to others. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Internet of things. Internet of things. Big data. Yes. Big data. How oh, oh, could to work with a different uh, interdisciplinarity? Interdisciplinary. <laughs> Franco, you should have a go as well. Did we skip you? Okay. I'm so a different frequency. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for note taking for us. Consistency. Consistency in? What's one consistent? Critical thinking. Critical thinking. Yes. Critical thinking. Okay. Transparency. Transparency. That's what I think. I have a list of a bunch of things I think about. I've got one that's integrity. Integrity. That's what I think. <laughs> ethics, ethics, <laughs> and integrity. Ethics and integrity. I'm yes. talking Norway. Yes. <laughs> um, I have three words that nobody mentioned. Can I see all the three words? Yes, please do. So, management, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Management, leadership, entrepreneurship. Innovation. Innovation. Creativity. Creativity.
But I go forward and they'll go backward. This is the Africa that we want. That is the African Union agenda. And this is what AU is driving for the next 50 years. So 2050 or something like that. Prosperous, integrated, good governance, peaceful, cultural identity, people driven, and then united. That's the Africa that we want. And we need to key into this. Uh, but if you go back, that's the Africa we have today. This is a place in Lagos. These are people going for work. There's no transport. And they are sitting on the top of the train. The train is moving about 50 kilometers an hour. Just, they're there. That's uh, right there. <laughs> moving. <in. laughs> okay, so secondly, we said we want to be united. We find that Africa is generally about five regions. And they are all in very big silos with thick walls around them. Uh, just take, these are some of the statistics from African AEDC. Uh, we see that uh, I've taken all of the engineering universities in Africa. We had a research fellow who did or collected all this data. Uh, you'll find that uh, most of the universities, African universities, are in North Africa. Latin, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, those three. And uh, the next is uh, uh, West Africa and then Eastern Africa. In terms of uh, gross domestic products, this is from IMF. Uh, you find again that uh, despite the fact that Nigeria is the largest economy in Africa, it is still, the region is still not. There are so many countries with very tiny GDPs. Uh, so again, North Af Northern Africa is still the largest economy in terms of regions. In terms of the languages, you find that we're in silos of uh, French, English, Portuguese, and Arabic. Uh, most of the Arabic-speaking countries actually speak French. In North Africa, everybody can understand French. Yes, and maybe Libya a little bit. I was in Morocco last year, and uh, I wasn't. I was able to communicate a little bit, but my colleague who went with me just couldn't do anything. He says this is a big. He doesn't know what's happening there. Okay, so that's the Africa is not united. It's no collaboration, and that's the. Now we 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 had a meeting with the manufacturers in Southern Africa and uh, Northern Africa. But if you go to Central Africa, Western Africa, actually nobody working from universities. In Nigeria, we produce about 16,000 graduates, engineering graduates, and the dean of the deans, the committee of deans, and we take the statistics. Likely 5% get job. Many of them do invent management and uh, cook, making of food and so on. Engineers. So my teaching mathematics and physics. Very little engineering jobs. You can see that is Africa that we have. Now the challenges that we noticed from the ground from this this came from this came from the industry people. These are the challenges. Uh, first of all, there, these are the organized other sector in, in Nigeria. And uh, we have met very exhaustively with the manufacturers association. Is it muted? No, it's not muted. Rotimi? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this, I have two more minutes. So we've, 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 talked, we've talked with Manufacturer Association. Uh, Manufacturer Association, there are about 2,000 members. <coughs> uh, contrary to some opinions, uh, that industries have closed in Nigeria, they're still there. Many of them, they've changed their, their form, they've metamorphosed something else. They're still there. Although more of them have changed, become churches, and so on. Uh, yeah, so we engage them, we engage all the chairmen of all the sectors voluntarily from the industry. We didn't go to them, they came to us. And uh, these are just quickly some of the things they identified. One, they need relevant educational training objectives. They want that, that we are not useful to the industry at all. In one of the industries, it says, I don't employ engineering graduates anymore. I was saying that was from Zimbabwe. He's the general manager for uh, what we call Baku Bank. So I don't employ them because they are not useful to me. Right in our face. Two, they said they need to be involved in the curriculum, not you creating yours and you sending sending us to us. Third thing they, also, they told us is that we need relevant industry experience for the faculty. 
They said the faculties don't know what's happening in the industry. And that's a fact. We publish high impact journals, but we don't know the high impact problems in the country. <laughs> and that's what that's the complaint. Uh, then the Nigeria in particular, there was a some reaction by government to make this done. But it was set aside by the politicians because there are no engineers in politics. Engineers are never in politics. They only repair the things that are to spoil. And therefore, when they jettisoned this a good program to make engineers practical, there was no engineer to, to, uh, to fight for it. Lastly, advocacy. Engineers don't go fighting. They don't go lobbying. And uh, so we say we need to teach engineers how to lobby, and because uh, that's the only way to get through to government. Okay, next. What are the reforms that we've taken based on the things they've said? We did a couple of things. Uh, these are the five things we're doing now. Uh, this was first of all discussed among all the deans in Nigeria, all the engineering deans. Uh, but we're taking covenant as the case study, as, as, as an example. We're trying it out now, and if it works out, because we have an MOU for all the deans. The first thing is that we need to bring professors in industry. There must be an engineering professional coming to teach in the university. And uh, I'll show you what we've done to get that to work. Secondly, we must send our faculty back, all our professors back into the industry for at least for seven days or 28 days. This was debated heavily for some of the one of these said. How can you take a professor to go to that industry to learn what? I was like, we need to learn. We don't know. We're totally disconnected. Third, <coughs> mentorship. We're going to have industry, industry, senior industry leaders being part of the college board and the department board. So they, they, are, they are there to decide what we do. And then lastly, this is a very important one, where we've said that they Projects, all projects by final year undergraduates and masters must come from industry and the community. We include community as an industry because there are many community problems. You come to Covenant University, I'm going to have seen that big run about when we keep traffic. We said, how come two engineering universities here? We've not have made a change here. So we have a we have a uh, timeline with the manufacturers. Uh, first of all, of course, is the is the Last day, we must get all this to be implemented. So we've done a lot of things. Now, for the teach, now we said there will be two things that the industry will do for us. In the teachers from industry coming into the university, and then also our training, all examples as much as possible we need must be a Nigerian problem. So if I'm going to make a, any problem we want to talk about, I will give one of the UK, that is to decolonize our thinking. Because we believe that every problem that we solve in Europe, they're unique in our place. And the environment, the context is different. So we need to take examples from Nigeria uh, or neighboring uh, West African countries to illustrate. So the, the manufacturers have agreed. We're going to sign an NDA, a non disclosure agreement, and we can video those and make sure they remove things that are proprietary, and then they bring it into, into the classroom. Uh, this is just an example of what we've done. What we did was in every program, we tried to group the courses. For instance, civil engineering, I'm not a civil engineer, so but these are what they did. They grouped it, they said this is the four areas where the civil engineering can be grouped. And those of you who are civil engineering, I think you may agree with me. I didn't do it. But I can show you mechanical, which I know we have about seven different areas in mechanical. So we grouped them and we linked every group to an industry. So if I have one, for instance, look at the thermodynamics. There's a power plant, the largest power plant we have. And the teacher will come from that, that particular industry. There's a label you signed with them. They will come and teach. And our, those uh, professors in thermodynamics will go there to see what's going on. And they will, they are very sharp. They will know what, what is new, what we have not been doing, and they bring it back. Uh, Okay, we have, for each of the teachers, we've got a terms of contract. We're giving them a small token because they're really well paid. Uh, so you know, we, they're willing to come. So we've got a, they will do four contact hours per semester, and then they will lecture. If it is possible, 
let us lecture in university, but if you want us to carry all the students to that factory, they go, or you bring the video uh, to show us. And then, uh, so that is the way we have agreed to be done. So, the, for online education, I think it's very important. The problem is that first, anything in Africa we think must be in French and English, because at least 80% of Africans speak either French or English. So if you do that, it is very cost effective. Uh, it must be always in French and English. Don't go in English and don't go in French. That silo needs to be broken. And you must use the faculties in the diaspora. They are very knowledgeable and usually they're cheap. They don't ask for money usually. You ask any from America, can you want to teach? Yeah, I want to teach. What time? 1 a.m. over there. What's the fee? Don't worry about that. I'm contributing to my to Africa. So use them. If you use, ask me, I say, I don't have the money to buy this and that, so you have to pay me. Okay, MOU for engineering faculty, you must have a, an agreement. That's the time. You must do that. So we're clear what the lines are, boundaries, and so on. That we've done for Nigerian universities is taking so much time to get those 15 universities to sign, almost two years. You must develop the, this is the biggest problem, number four. Engineering courses need, you need to touch the hardware. I think so the MIT is doing something, but we need to develop course, uh, ways in which you can interact with the laboratory equipment, the uh, facilities, and it should be digital, and we can interact with that hardware uh, online. So that is the thing we need to work on. I'm training somebody on Python. They said Python is the right way to teach. So we're training people on Python to be able to connect. And the platform must be cheap and free. We don't have money. We need something that is free. Like Moodle is free. If you can get the APIs to work so that they can interact with the hardware, I think Africans will take that. We always like something free. Uh, then we must, uh, there is this. Uh, e common e-learning sites. We have some of these, uh, what they call the research education networks. In, that, in, in West Africa, we have an e-course one, we have in Nigeria. I think we need to develop that. That's about the best option for us. If we can develop it because, uh, but again, the problem is that the universities don't like to share their things. Africans would like to collaborate with Europe and America, but you go to any conference, you see all the Africans, they are all pursuing the man from Cambridge or the man from the uh, University of Toronto. But you never see the Africans sitting together. We don't collaborate. And lastly, uh, because my time is up, I just mentioned that we need to include things like mechatronics. That's right. Uh, I think that's all. I thought you were showing the director. Uh, and, uh, as we're going along, I think I begin to appreciate uh, uh, the relevance of uh, what you're doing. That's why I think uh, what I appreciate most is the, the definition of the problem. I think you identify the very, very challenging uh, problem, which is uh, the challenge that I'm going to come with uh, the growth of cities. And I think that is the solution. And uh, you, are, you are identifying, you are handling it in a different way that you have the skills that will be required uh, to address it. So, so, that, so that, is, that, that is appreciated. Now, your, how they are, how our experiences at the University of Zambia, uh, maybe on sustainability of engineering leadership, how we handle this, and how we're going to handle this going forward. Uh, firstly, I think I need to acknowledge that uh, online education, I think, uh, is a must. And I don't think uh, the strategy is going to go back, but we are, this is a way, education, we are going to the uh, university with our goals. And I think the internet is going to change the way things have been done, uh, education, the way education has been delivered uh, in the past. And uh, everyone in the whole world, there's no individual who doesn't need education, and they need higher education. So mass, I mean, the internet offers us an opportunity uh, to go mass education, even in engineering. You know, there are still challenges, though. Uh, so, I think there's so many of us to go this in a limited way, I would say. Uh, at the School of Engineering, we require all lecturers to put the material online on Moodle. We have started that. It's been a challenge, and there are people who are still, we still drag and push 
<laughs> not everyone has done it, but we made an attempt at that. And uh, a number of people are responding, and they say, we're going to process a very big effort, a big challenge. Uh, so when I see this, uh, by coming here and uh, I mean about this, and say, maybe, maybe there are one or two things that I can learn from here. And, uh, uh, and we did a proposal, or actually a project proposal, that we did to work out. We made a proposal to be funded by TFID. What we're looking at, uh, Distance, and when I talk about distance, I think there's a strong connection, distance education and uh, online uh, education. I think he, online does facilitate distance education very well. And so it's something that we are still putting together, and we are holding that if there is an opportunity, I think we want to still move in that direction and then get the other stakeholders. And coming here, I think you can see that there are a number of people we can work with, and then if there's a proposal like that. Now, because the challenges that we are dealing with are real. We, we think, especially in cities, and not cities, that uh, we were thinking it's very important that we set up systems that uh, even within it's not just education, because you can train people, but when they go in the work environment, how do they fit in? How do they, they are, how, how, how are they, you know, uh, how, are they, how do they fit into industry? Because the industry might not just be organized in a way which might make uh, the most of the skills. So we need a project, I think, that will look into these issues and say maybe it's not only the human resource side, but the organizational side of things as well that needs to be addressed uh, at national levels. So on another, maybe another page also, we, as a, at the rest of the day, we are currently running a talking to the issue that was talking about the, we are already a project funded by uh, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, UK. It's called High Education Partnership in South Southern Africa project EPSO. And uh, <coughs> it involves uh, a number of aspects. First networking with regions, we are the hub and there are a number of other universities. Uh, other spoken universities uh, we have Poker Belt University which invest in Zambia this time, and we have, have Namibia University of Science and Technology, uh, Malawi Science, University of Science and Technology, and the UJ. I'm not quite sure if you're aware. <laughs> we are also, so we are trying to learn from others how are they doing this, how are they approaching these, uh, these uh, problems, and uh, maybe. Uh, so, for the training purposes, we have that one component. And then we have uh, an aspect that involves industry academia exchanges where members of staff uh, and university go into industry for a while and also members of staff in industry come to teach. Uh, so we are doing this. And also the project is identifying the issue, is dealing with the issue of internships. I mean, these are uh, student investments because by the time students go out in employment, by the time students go out into uh, uh, into, into industry, they need to have been exposed to what really goes on in industry. And uh, the other aspect is curriculum review. We are using industry to have input. It's like right now we are doing curriculum review at post undergraduate and postgraduate levels, and uh, industry is going to be engaged. The issue of online uh, teaching, or uh, even just using uh, software, especially for packages like AutoCAD and the, all the other programs. We are incorporating that into our curriculum so that uh, by the time, because there are a lot of problems that we want from industry that uh, our graduates, they have to go into school when they go into industry because uh, when they use the industry, you find we don't teach them that. So challenges, I think uh, uh, there are a number of challenges like have indicated to ask staff, academic staff, to put their material online is a challenge. So, I don't think it's about corporate. Some people are just not uh, <laughs> into technology. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, that's one challenge. Staff capabilities need to be addressed. I think as we move ahead, uh, we need to move everyone, uh, carry everyone along, and maybe some kind of training that we had at Harvest and uh, Toronto. And also, institutional organization. We've learned here that uh, Toronto has got an office 
that is shepherding everyone in this direction. We still don't have those, those issues, and then we, we are learning that uh, maybe this is something that needs to happen. The hardware aspect also, uh, we also that's, that's, a, that's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. And, and I think uh, well, this is uh, something that is being solved, the issue of quality assurance. Because engineering, you need uh, hands-on. If you do something online, I mean, you need to bring some people on to some uh, laboratory to do experiments. And I think that needs to be addressed. These are my observations. It's a very good project. And I think the network that you are creating, I think uh, maybe the future looks like it might even grow. But you, we need to consider maybe writing project proposals that uh, fund uh, the, the concern that we are hearing here is, I mean, this is a very loose arrangement. And uh, if I'm going to come to a meeting, even coming here, I need to, no, I need to get permission from the investor. There's no agreement, there's no nothing. So how do I come and uh, how do I make a contribution to this? So I think going into the future, I think as you, this project evolves, you need to find ways of uh, maybe having some kind of agreement with uh, uh, the institution that you are working with. Of course, we understand this is the internal funding, uh, uh, but that's why I'm encouraging that uh, people behind this project that you consider writing a project proposal. It's a worthy uh, 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 project because the challenge that you're addressing is real. So if it's going to be a very big problem. The issues uh, of cities, Drainage, we have very serious drainage issues in Osaka. Water supply for African cities is a challenge, very, very big problem. Waste management, we have uh, diseases uh, break out. I think if you address the issue of uh, infrastructure, you can uh, reduce the disease burden to a very large extent. Because we are talking about solid waste, sewer waste, transportation. This is slowing down, it's not improving productivity because people take most of their time on the road to get to work and from work. So this is uh, a minus. The issue of recreation, housing, even crowd management, because if you are going to use uh, information and uh, information and communication technologies, you can be, you know, be able to uh, manage even crime and access reduction in terms of uh, transportation system. These are thoughts that I thought maybe just here from you. Thank you. Um, it's really great to be here and thank you for the opportunity. Can everybody hear me? Yes. I'll try and speak. All right. Um, I had three different presentations planned because I wasn't sure where we were going. I wasn't sure how much time I would have and I wasn't sure what the mood in the, in the room would be like. And last year, I was at an international conference where I actually did a presentation on decolonizing um, education for, for our universities. And I was more or less booed out of the room. Gilbert was in the space. Um, but it was an international conference. There were scholars from Africa. There were scholars from, from uh, North America. Well, and they more or less told me that I'm living in La La Land, that we decolonized at the end of the, of, of, you know, when, what, what, at the end of the Second World War, I was told. And the more I was saying, no, we need to decolonize right now, the more they just told me to go home. So I thought I don't actually have the courage to stand here today and go through the next session of you all booing me out of the room. So I thought I'd actually for the first time in a very long time tell a happy story because usually my papers, my presentations are these stories of oh my gosh, why did we do it that way? But I'm going to shamelessly, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit you well, I wrote the paper on decolonizing, decolonizing education, planning education in particular, but engineering education. And if you want if you want that reference, I would love your critical feedback if you want to. It's, 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 it has since been published. Instead, as I said, I'm going to talk about a, a happy story. I titled it, Where To From Now? Imagining that, that we were talking about online education and something to think about when, if, if we are serious about online education, if we are serious about collaborating, learning from each other, learning from it tells case studies. We need to make sure that our, our education is relevant. We need to make sure that our education is relevant for our students, for our, uh, for our continent context. We need to, it needs to be pragmatic. There needs to be participation. There needs to be this notion of not just 
only thinking about um, economies of scale, out of the box thinking, innovation, um, and, and, and various other, in fact, quite a lot of social skills until we decided that we need to be part of these two. All right, but on that, and transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary, on that, there is something in terms of this happy story I want to share with you that we're actually doing well at UCT. One and only thing we're doing well at UCT, <laughs> everything else needs to be questioned. And that is this notion of, um, and it speaks to all these skills that we spoke to, and that really is this notion, I'm going to go quickly so that there's I'm not eating up in your time, um, and it's this notion of, of engaged scholarship, or this notion of, we started off 10 years ago, a little bit longer than 10 years ago, with this notion of responsive, um, uh, social responsiveness, being socially responsive, making sure that we're working in community with community, or in fact working with um, industry, as we learned from Chris's presentation, that was a fantastic thing that they're doing um, at, at, at Covenant University, working with industry. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we've been doing at UCT for at least 10 years, if not longer. And the thing that makes it work is that we actually have um, we have central university support. So it's not something we're just doing in our faculties or as individual members of staff, academia, faculty members. We're not just doing this in our programs. We in fact have support from the university. And this support from the university comes in the form of um, a brokering um, initiative. So, so, so we have a, a broker, and we call this the, the UCT Knowledge Co-op. And this broker sort of, um, if there's a particular issue that communities have, say around um, water management, they would approach us, they would approach the broker, and ask the broker who in the university is doing research on this. And the broker, the university, this UCT Knowledge Co-op, would combine the two organizations, or would combine the researcher or the students, or the teaching environment with, with um, community organization or with industry etc etc I'm going to go I'm going to I'm going to show us demonstrate some of the advantages of doing that so firstly we have this brokering organization secondly we actually have recognition so in our promotions our annual promotions it's recognized every year we celebrate the social responsiveness or engaged scholarship workshops um, at, at, at work that happens we there are awards for that and we, have, we actually have money set aside to enable these projects, to facilitate them and to make them happen. So we usually have money for nothing, but we have seem to have money for this. All right, um, and the point I'm trying to make is that for at least 10 years, UCT has sponsored this notion of engaged scholarship. Just make sure that you, we're all on the same page. So what I'm talking about here is we're talking about experiential learning, we were talking about learning by doing, but it's slightly more than just case study, because what this is, in fact, is learning by, by working in community, with community, or working with industry, as you do, working with municipal officials, and all of that is recognized. So it's, it's basically learning, working with a partner who's non, a non-academic partner. So that is how that's defined. And what's most important, sorry, let me just go, because the universities have this, um, because the university has had this uh, commitment for over ten years to engage scholarship, um, we've actually noticed that in the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment, the number of courses that enable or that that are geared towards engaged scholarship has those num that number has increased significantly. And I'm going to come back to that increase in the students who are taking those courses. So when we're thinking about um, remote uh, teaching, or when we're thinking about you know, putting our work on, uh, online, I also want to ask you please to think about the advantages of this kind of teaching learning and how this might still happen if we're doing remote teaching. So, so if you can just think about it. I look through it because the colors don't appear and I can't zoom it out. But so the number of courses that then are geared towards inspiring our students to become reflective practitioners, to become critical thinkers, to work in the real world, as Gilbert, Gilbert mentioned earlier, that has increased the number of courses that are all about um, learning by doing new kinds of teaching, new kinds of practices, 
in teaching, new ways of teaching, and most importantly, really encouraging students to respect local knowledge. So, so often, engineers and built environment professionals have this knowledge that they've been taught, theoretical knowledge, and they believe that they are the experts. And, and so what we're trying to do here is to say to students, you do have knowledge, but how about being a little bit more open to what you can learn in the field? And how does that change and make us think differently about a particular problem? And be really open, and let's see how, we can, how that knowledge can exchange and how it can, in fact, improve theory. So what we've done with many of these courses is, in fact, create Southern theory, if you want. So theory that we learn from, from practice and whilst we're working in the field. So above all else, we use our courses, we use our, <coughs> our exchanges, our, our projects, and these are all projects that are not in the classroom, they're in the field. We use these projects, these courses, to co-produce knowledge. Right. Um, and so I wanted just to give you a few examples, and I didn't know um, that the majority of folk here today would be mostly civil engineers, I've been working with engineers for the past three years, so I've always had to make sure I cover all the bases so that the chemical engineers, stories about chemical engineering, stories about <clears throat> electrical engineering, etc., etc. But I just wanted to share a few courses that's sort of covering all the bases. I would have only presented the civil engineering courses had I known. Um, but I wanted to, so, so these are just a few, and, um, and the thing here is that there are many, many more. And the very first one is a fourth year course in civil engineering. We have a four year, it could be an honours, four year qualifying professional engineering degree. I'm sure that's the same in most of the, the, the engineering programs across the continent. And this particular chemical engineering course focuses on integrating systems intelligence with environmental sustainability by working with um, informal food traders in looking at cleaner, less expensive, more efficient ways of producing. Um, uh, food products. So it's the street trade, street food, uh, and cleaner, more efficient approaches. And this is this particular course started when a group of um, street uh, food producers were, came to the university and said, it, it costs a lot of money to buy the, the fuel, the, the, the wood, to burn, um, you know, to make heat, to, to cook. Um, in addition to that, um, many of us are suffering from respiratory issues. So do you know of a researcher who's doing work to help us become more efficient, cleaner, so that we can also do something with the waste product? And so that was the, one of those cases where, in fact, there was a course in, in civil engineering, in chemical engineering, fourth year course. And in fact, the students who took that course, some of them went on to, to carry on working with, with based organizations with informal food traders and went on to do their masters and PhD work in this and are still doing this and in, in, in terms of being innovative and generating new knowledge are doing amazing around climate change mitigation um, energy um, uh, and poverty reduction and in fact this course includes a service learning component and part of that service learning component is to supply solar water heaters as Rain was saying, I mean, we have lots of good sun, and these solar water heaters are the, the design thereof is done with residents um, and, then, and then implemented. So that's another course. Um, uh, 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 <clears throat> still a different example because I put the mind some architecture work here. There's a project that the architecture um, students do in second year, but I won't mention too much about that. And then a, a third year civil engineering course on urban water management, um, and of course we've met, most of us have been speaking about urban water management. And this has been a fantastic course in looking how to, to manage fresh water and, and um, storm water, waste water, in a water scarce con uh, context. So that we don't in fact impact negatively on rural water sources. And this project has been with, with industry and with municipal officials. And the kinds of innovative approaches Students learn with community, in terms of this time community and by community industry and, and, and with municipal officials. And in so doing, we're out of the classroom. We're not in the classroom, we're in the boardrooms, we're wherever we need to be. And a final project is a project that Gilbert was involved in many years ago. It's a project that I've, I've run for three years running. 
I'm still running it, but um, it's a little on the side because we're going through uh, all kinds of uh, uh, political constraints. But this is looking at informal settlement upgrading. We're working with community leaders, with residents, making sure that residents have security of tenure. And of course, there are engineering problems on the site in that the site is dealing with um, is, is located on a, on, a, on a former waste disposal site. And so there's methane and all kinds of other pollution, the pollutants happening on the site, affecting residents' health, but it's also affecting the underground water. So it was at that point that we actually got the, the um, chemical engineers and we got the, um, the civil engineers to work with us. And there was a moment where we were doing a collaborative project with, with all the folks. And that was real transdisciplinary learning. By the way, if we're serious about transdisciplinary, well, uh, transdisciplinary learning or interdisciplinary learning, we also need to realize that we speak different languages, but might mean the same thing, that it takes a while to learn each other's language. Yes. <laughs> so on that, I was wondering why you're suggesting that we do everything in English and French when we should be doing it in easy Kosa, Zulu. Alright, I'm going to more or less stop there because I don't want to talk too much, but there was one more course. And as I said, the number of courses that we're doing where we're not in the classroom. We were actually hanging out in community or in whatever lab outside of the university or in fact we're residents, community residents like our community based informal setups, we're residents were in our in our labs or in our studios. The number of courses that, that do this that aren't just experiential, that work with real people with real concerns, that those and that number has increased significantly. And one final one to mention is in fact one that is facilitated by um, a social anthropologist. It's, we call it the social infrastructures course. It's an elective. This would be a really good course to see how we can get some of this um, onto an online uh, space. And this social infrastructures course is open to all engineering students, regardless of year of study. Uh, it's 18 credit elective. And it really exposes students to all the skills that, that we mentioned, to think creatively, to, but to learn from local knowledge. So it's very much community-based. It's about exposing students to the realities of the socio-economic um, inequalities in African cities and how do we address that. And so this, this particular course begins with a reflection, so what have you learned as an engineering student? Write that down, tell us a story then what do you imagine you're going to use your skills for in an African context, in an African city? And then the students spend six months in community, learning from community, and their final assignment isn't a test, but it's another reflection paper. So what did you learn? And look at the answers that you gave at the beginning of the course, and look at the answers now. And it's the, the nuance is phenomenal. So this course is so popular that we have more than 200 students wanting to um, register for it every year. We can only take 100 students at any one time. So we've run it twice, we run it both semesters. And we work with five different NGOs working on specific issues, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's renewable energy, and, and students choose which group they want to work with and from whom they want to learn. And the reason I'm exposing or telling you these this happy story is that as you know, you know, we've had three years of hardcore um, student 2017 year, um, we couldn't finish the academic year. The Faculty of Engineering had to in fact stop the year and there was one one quarter of a four quarter program that was missing and we had to move that into the next academic year. And so and, and in fact engineering students and um, and and um, and built environment students were at the forefront of the protests. The, the, the university was shut, the university was spray painted, the university was burned, and we were, we were a little bit luckier than some of my colleagues have experienced. And the reason I'm showing you these, these images is of course to be provocative, but not just that. The reason I'm showing you these images is because after this, and I was at the forefront, I spoke, I spent a lot of time with the 
the fullest movements and with students, and with particular our students. And the students who were the least cheesed off, the students who said, yes, we, we might not, we were calling for decolonized education, but the students who found that decolonization was already happening in the engineering program were the students who were taking the courses that I've just mentioned. So the students who were, who were enrolled in the social infrastructures course, or whatever other course, learning with community, in community, we're arguing that that's exactly what we mean by decolonized education. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so for money to that and how to Yeah, um, I've already, um, we have discussed, I'm from the Colbert University, I'm the Dean of the School of Belt Environment. I should mention that a few years ago, before uh, we had the School of Engineering, the civil engineering was in the School of Belt Environment. And then we had a school called uh, School of Technology. So when we broke up that school, a new school of engineering was established. So civil engineering also moved in that particular school so that we, we can have all the engineering courses in the School of Engineering. So in the Belt environment, then we remain with uh, mainly uh, construction related uh, programs. We have uh, the design program, the Bachelor of Architecture. We have also construction economics and management, where we have construction management and quantity survey. survey. Then we have real estate studies and urban and regional planning. So when we talk land use planning, which my colleague uh, from Monza was talking about, we plan the cities, although Erastas was telling us we don't do a very good job of planning. <laughs> <laughs> it's not here. Yeah. But those are our graduates, and of course we can imagine that we are dealing with uh, the primary issue of planning cities and the urban growth that is taking place. It means we have to start addressing it within our school. But talking about engineering and construction uh, program challenges, I looked at it a little bit differently. I, I looked at it from our problems within uh, CPU, and I'm hoping that that will be able to highlight on a few things that we want to look at in terms of providing this education and how we can move forward. I'll mention a few things uh, which we are also doing to try to overcome some of these things. The first thing that obviously comes to, which hits us as a corporate university is lack of uh, infrastructure, space. So we, we have to deal with that. That relates to engineering and construction uh, courses. Of course, we, we need to have laboratories built. I should also mention that at CBU, we are, we are now in like six places. We are running the, the university, it's called Nkuba University. This used to be a college and the government turned into a university. And uh, with its problems, it has been given to Copperbelt University to run, so that we can push it to a university standard. Professor Moya did talk about his problems. They have uh, Chalimbana University, isn't it? Which we are managing, Azusa. Yeah, uh, Murungushi, which is another university, Murungushi University, the third uh, public university, is also running Kwame Nkuruma. <clears throat> which used to be the College of Education at one particular time. So, CBU, we are running Uwa University, we are also at Riverside Campus in Kitwe, which is the main campus. We are also in Tinsali, which is another university government built, uh, but at the time, there were issues of running it, so we ended up with that. So we have to put laboratories there. Also, we have science-related uh, programs in agriculture and other such programs. We are now also in Lusaka. We, we have a campus there. We have a mining related campus in Solwezi, which is called the new copper belt. Again, we need facilities like labs and all that to be able to run those programs. So of course those are issues of sorts shortage of space. Now you can't just have buildings. Of course the next thing is to have equipment in those laboratories. So we as uh, the Belt Environment, uh, Dr. Mulea here has a project they're running on 
aggregate, we are trying to collect aggregates around the country to see what material comes from where, which would feed into the building industry. And uh, that project means lab. So we are using uh, the civil engineering lab. We share that lab now as you can tell you on the side. It has been a challenge because of lack of uh, certain facilities which we need in order to, to run these uh, research uh, programs. So equipping uh, these labs is also a challenge. There's obviously lack of senior faculty members. Like I said, engineering came in uh, later on, so we, we have to build capacity to that senior level. And it has been a challenge. Uh, to get uh, lecturers up to senior levels. We, we've been struggling a little bit. Part of it, people don't come back, we send them for training. We have a very good staff development program. But many times people go, they get their PhDs, and we hear they're in Japan. <laughs> they get the PhDs, they're in the US. So we, we have to try and see how we can move in that particular area. The other part which we have been experiencing as cities is um, poorly qualified entrance. Here I mean our grade 12 school leavers and getting into science uh, programs. It has been a challenge. I don't know how UNSA sees it, but there is usually a problem in mathematics, in science subjects and so in the first year, you tend, you tend to have a high rate of failure in mathematical um, programs. Oh, I forgot to also mention that we have uh, the School of Medicine. Uh, Michael Chief us at the School of Medicine, based in Dola. So we have to also, we're also training medical doctors. So we have to get from this group, and sometimes it is a challenge. Also. Some of you who are not in Zambia or who are, haven't been in Zambia long, we also sometimes have a problem of leakages at grade 12 examinations. Yes. Only two, three days ago, there was a news item that at least 258 teachers were found with fake certificates. Wow. Of course, it's higher in Tanzania because we had like 10,000 and all. But that is a problem which the system has to, to look at. But of course, we receive these students and we have to train them to a certain level. The challenges continue here. We are a state-aided institution, and funding every year is becoming a challenge. We are actually being taught as uh, state universities to start looking for our own resources. Now we are in a traditional mode. Here we are talking tradition and moving away from tradition, isn't it? So we are at that point that we have to move as a CBU to a level where we can find more money to do what we have to do, including equipping the labs and other things that we have to do. Now how do we do that? 90% of our clients right now are funded by government. They are in public tuitions, undergraduates. So which means that if we don't get our pay properly from the financials to the students, then we are stuck. Yes. So we have to move beyond the undergraduates and start looking at more postgraduate programs because these are paid for by the, there is no bursary at, bursary at that level. So these have to be paid for by the students. So we, at CBU, we are moving, we have a, a school of graduate studies, we have a campus in Riverside, and this is where we're trying to push most of the activities so that we can generate more money. Of course, consultancies and research also uh, comes in, but this takes time before you can reach a level where you, you are like UCT. Uh, you have money coming from various sources. So some British universities, which I know have billions of dollars in endowment, and they can be able to do the same thing. At a certain level, we, we seem to have lack of political will to fund postgraduate education. For many years, the focus has been to look at 
the undergraduate because the argument which I also found when I was at the World Bank Conference in, was in March this year in one of the sessions was that Africa doesn't need so much training at very high levels. What you need is people to do the everyday practical work. Now, if you were thinking like that, what you're saying is that in fact we'll be behind for many years because then we can't think of the solution or conceptualize problems before they happen. So we'll be running behind uh, these uh, other countries. When it comes to to providing open or online education, then the problem is that if you have already a problem in providing physical infrastructure, uh, space, equipment, and other things that you have to use for engineering, it's even a bigger problem if you have to go online because you need to have these facilities all in place. So we, we have certain challenges I think I'll just go through have been flushed and cut by <laughs> okay. Obviously, if you have limited ICT uh, equipment, that will be a problem. There is obviously limited skills in uh, production of online training. Uh, I think that's the purpose of even being here. Although, a few like two, three weeks ago, we had some training from Commonwealth of Learning. It was also talking about e-learning and trying to develop. And so we have a lot of things also going in that direction. There is limited use of open educational resources, and this is what Commonwealth of Learning was talking about. Lack of software and equipment uh, for virtual laboratories. I think if you are going online, then you have to think how you provide these um, practical aspects. We are a design school, for instance, how do you show, how do you teach someone to design this in a remote place? That obviously is a huge uh, challenge. So before I just get there, I thought I should just mention a few things that like trying to link with industry and others. We, the Concord University is now an African center of excellence in sustainable mining. So we have some money coming through the World Bank and we're trying to have all these programs to do with uh, sustainable development. As a school, we have been running a project in collaboration with uh, VTT of Finland, a research center of Finland, to try and green our syllabus, to try and look at uh, certain aspects that don't enable us to include green building concepts within our syllabus. Remember I said we train architects, so if we can include those concepts, in the design, then as it goes forward, then we can be able to capture these uh, particular aspects. And of course, we already um, we are in the process of procuring at least um, ten sets of uh, online education equipment through the Ministry of uh, Infrastructure. So we want to put those at various sites in Chinsali, like I said, Chinsali, Osaka, Kitwe. So that we, instead of, because lecturers have actually been moving from the Copperbelt to Western Province, Northwestern, to teach on mining, we have to move from the Copperbelt to Chinsali, which is how many? Six, seven hundred kilometers. So we are saying if we have this equipment, then we don't have to, to move around. So you can be at Riverside Campus and teaching a class. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our different speakers. It was, it was very difficult to stop any of you and then um, talk, uh, talks were so interesting. So our friends in Toronto and Professor um, Metcalf in Boston have been patiently waiting and we're wondering whether you guys have any comments. Corey, maybe over to you for a few observations as uh, we're it's about five minutes there for total things to wrap up. But over to you guys in Toronto and Corey. Press, just press the, the screen. You will see the uh, icons, then go to participants, and then you select the speaker. This is your one. Uh, first of all, thank you so much on behalf of the uh, to for, for you to be here. Uh, I wanted to give this floor a little bit to our scholars to say a couple of comments, but we may not have time for that. We can leave those conversations for uh, you know, on the sidelines of the conference. We're continually seeing this. 
We truly appreciate your feedback, hopefully your partnership yeah. in the future. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to make sure everybody knows there's a welcome cocktail by a friend at the BIA conference tonight at 7 p.m. I understand it's at the main, uh, main uh, restaurant, so we can all meet there and continue conversations and on other lines. Yeah, I think they're getting back home. Okay. Thank you, teacher, the professors who uh, uh, spoke at this great set of talks and uh, uh, ideas from across the continent. I think it really did illustrate kind of the sweep of issues uh, that uh, that were all present here that range from the. Um, specific issues of infrastructure on the continent and in cities on the continent uh, to yes. the uh, background of other, uh, the, uh, other underlying issues uh, uh, which provide a backdrop that Professor Winkler uh, talked about uh, at the end of her uh, on discussion through to the questions of the current reality of engineering education and to the uh, issues and challenges of uh, changes in the current engineering education environment. Uh, so I thought this was an excellent uh, sweep of discussion and something that perhaps there could be an integrated perspective emerge from this that at least uh, fleshes out uh, to some extent the range of issues here. Thank you so much, Corey. It's been actually way more exciting and excellent to be here. So we missed you here, but we've done a bunch of recording and thanks to us on some of the excellent experiences and the nice insights here. Lulu, do you have any uh, last minute? I know that Lulu uh, has been uh, <laughs> tweeting that, that and others, and uh, Lulu has been uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just provide some observations. Um, you know, this is uh, some very interesting and exciting discussion. But something that has come to mind is that perhaps we need a new paradigm for engineering education in Africa that is really grounded on these local contexts and issues um, that Professor Winkler alluded to. Um, and I'm very interested in this idea of decolonizing education. Um, even though Tamanda didn't really talk to that as much, but I think this is something that um, is, is quite relevant. Um, given the, the issues that we're talking about. Um, I'm also seeing two additional opportunities um, when you think about education in Africa. The first is this idea of leapfrogging, which I thought was extremely interesting because in the research that I do, for example, when you're looking at energy in African cities, um, the consumption, the energy consumption of, of a lot of these cities is very, very low when you look at it when you compare that to other cities such as in Canada and in the West. And so there really is that opportunity to leapfrog towards sustainability um, and to realize those um, energy savings um, in emissions, for example. And the last thing that I think there's a great opportunity in is this industry um, engineering education linkages um, that we heard about through the talks. And I think as we can think about educating students and building that capacity we're really training the future leaders, the future industry leaders, the future policy makers to really think about these issues um, and build out the sustainable cities of the future. So um, I really enjoyed this and thank you so much. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you, Lulu. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us online. Uh, oh, there you go, we have Professor Bolo joining us finally online. No, I'm very nice. I'm very nice. I'm very nice. No problem. Uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, he's been playing. Uh, he's a Zoom expert. We didn't know that. So this is amazing. We just found out uh, this, this platform uh, a few months ago. Found a recommendation actually from uh, I think from Gilbert. Uh, and it's been working flawlessly for us since. It's to, to that up to that point, I was really not quite a believer in online education until this project has come about. And since then, I, I now am confident that it's going to happen and it will happen. And hopefully, we've given you guys some you know, things to think about. Uh, hopefully, we collaborate more in the future. We exchange information, we exchange knowledge, and uh, we've made a tremendous number of new friends here. We look forward to the PLR conference and doing some of that more. Thank you for your support for our projects, for your friendships. 
great collaboration and hopefully with uh, much more to come. I'm sorry we're out of time. We couldn't tackle more questions and stuff for the panel particularly, but uh, we did continue the discussion over, over the um, um, welcome cocktail tonight as well as tomorrow and the following days at the IIT conference. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you Maureen and, and friends from uh, Toronto for joining us. Um, I think we can adjourn at the moment. So we thank you all for, for your, for your help. And your support.